We now return to Minute by Minute here on a and &E. July 17, 1981, Kansas City, 7.06 p.m. At the Hyatt Regency Hotel, two massive steel and concrete skywalks have just collapsed onto hundreds of people enjoying the hotel's tea dance. The area just inside the main entrance is now a mountain of smoking rubble. The collapse has broken a water main, and the lobby is slowly filling up with water. No one knows how many are dead, or how many more cling desperately to life, buried beneath the debris. Tom Weir and his wife, Jean, were standing directly below the second floor walkway when it came crashing down. Somehow, Tom is conscious, though in excruciating pain. The left leg was up across my chest, next to my head. My head was sideways on the floor, and I never hurt so much in my life. Weir has no idea where his wife, Jean, is, or if his friends, Chuck and Jane Hayes, are safe. 11-year-old Dalton Grant is buried nearby with a broken pelvis. His mother, Connie, is a few inches away with two broken ankles. She was just up and to the right of me. I could touch her leg. My mom, luckily, was an emergency room nurse. She said, don't go to sleep. You go into a coma when you're in that severe shock. Radio newsman Chuck Hayes is pinned from the waist down at the lobby's south end, staring up at a section of the fourth floor bridge that is propped at a dangerous angle. His legs are shattered, and he has six compression fractures in his spine. I can remember lying there, looking around me in this gray water, and the water turned from gray to a murky red, which was blood. His wife, Jane, is close by. Though her body is almost completely crushed, she is still alive. At the north end of the lobby, Mark Williams has managed to survive in a space the size of a suitcase. My right leg was across my chest and behind my left ear. My left leg was out of the socket and back up across my back and behind my right ear. Five minutes after the collapse, dozens of 911 calls go out to the police and fire departments. There may be 50 to 100 people. Oh, Jesus. Come to the Hyatt Regency immediately. Three sky bridges fell in. Three what? Three sky bridges holding people from the third floor fell and crashed. Kansas City Fire Department Deputy Chief Arnett Williams is in his office at station number 10 when a call comes in from his dispatcher. The terminology was that there had been some kind of collapse at uh, at the Hyde Regency Hotel. I couldn't fathom that this would ever happen. This is the newest structure, I think, in Kansas City at that particular time, one of the most modern. Williams sends four pumpers and two truck companies in response. Other emergency personnel race to the scene. The call came in, and it came in for, I believe, a structural collapse. Had no idea what we were going into. Eight miles from the Hyatt, Dr. Joe Wackerly walks into the emergency department, exhausted after exercising for an hour. He is about to go home when a nurse stops him. The nurse said to me, you have a call from the ambulance dispatch people. And I said, what do they need? I'm not on duty. And she said, I don't know. So I got on the phone and they said, the roof is caved in and there's some people hurt. Wackerly throws on scrubs over his workout clothes and races to the hotel. Kansas City Mayor Richard Berkeley is holding a reception at his home when he receives a phone call informing him of the disaster. He and his driver jump in his car. We dashed out. I don't think I met a single guest that night, though a couple of them might have arrived by the time I left. Uh, immediately went down to the hotel. 250 miles away in St. Louis, the man who helped design the Hyatt, 52-year-old structural engineer Jack Gillum, returns home from dinner to a ringing phone. It is a business associate of his. I picked it up, and he says, Jack, uh, there's been a collapse at the Hyatt. Um, I just was dumbfounded. I mean, it was just like a something hitting you in as hard as it can in your stomach. Gillum immediately charters a plane to the scene. 
In the hotel's lobby, hundreds of gallons of water from the ruptured sprinkler system are still pooling on the floor. After I walked in, I noticed there was a lot of water. I looked and it was red water. You know? And I'm assuming that this is the cover of the carpet, but after further examination, I found out that this was blood. Deputy Chief Williams sets up a command post outside the main entrance. He orders his men to cut off the water and the electricity, but this will take precious time. Many victims trapped beneath the debris are in danger of drowning. The debris was right here, so I couldn't really lift my head. There was a one circle of light that was coming into where I was, and the water kept rising and shutting off that light and that air. What I would do was suck in a mouthful of water, and try to raise my head, spit it out, get a breath of air, and then put my head back down again. The water is coming up to where I'm starting to breathe it in my nose. And I kept thinking to myself, well, if this is the way I got to go, I've read this isn't too bad. Twenty minutes after the collapse, Dr. Joe Wackerly arrives on the scene to find the dazed and wounded streaming out of the hotel. After setting up a makeshift triage unit on the Hyatt's front lawn with two fellow doctors, he assumes leadership of the medical care inside the hotel. You really have to collect your presence for a moment. Take what resources are currently available and give those to the people that we think have the best chance of survival. And the other people we have to basically say, you need to make your peace with your God because there's nothing I can do right now. Kansas City Fire Department media liaison, Joe Galetti, arrives. I could see all these bodies uh, protruding from the edges of the skywalks. And it was a shock. It was a real shock. Uh, people were screaming, people were running, uh, panicked. Emergency workers try their best to do their jobs amidst the carnage. It was uh, hot summertime, very hot, and uh, people were screaming and crying for, for air. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. It was just terrible. There was a man just inside the lobby. He was trapped under some debris, and I, I felt like somebody was looking at me. And so I, I made eye contact with him, and it was like, you know, he was really dead. You always have that moment when you say, am I really ready for this? Am I trained for this? Am I going to do a good job? Oh, please let me do a good job. 40 minutes after the collapse. Dozens of victims are still inside, trapped or buried beneath the rubble. I knew the people around me were dead. I mean, I knew instantly. I, I won't go into how I knew, but it was, I knew. People were hurt badly. They were screaming, they were crying, they were moaning. You start to figure it out that the chances aren't good. Underneath a precariously balanced wedge of concrete on the lobby's south side, Chuck Hayes tries to speak to his severely injured wife, Jane. I said, are you there? And she said, yes, I am. I'm hurt. And I said, I know you are, sweetheart. I know you're hurt bad. But hang on. Help will be here. And I said, I love you. Jane slips into unconsciousness. She and all of the victims need help fast, but they must fight to stay alive while firefighters formulate an unorthodox rescue plan. That's next when Minute by Minute returns here on a and &E.